Hello. Reese from the Point Music Podcast thingy. Back again. Uh, this one was a super special one. Um, I have to say that it was an absolute joy talking to the, the fantastic and seriously, immensely, stupidly talented Nathan Cavalieri uh, about his new album, Miracles, and the tour that he's on, which is a massive run of dates. We talk about the, how Miracles came together, and we talk about the tour, and then we go into some mental health stuff too, because that's all part of the process with how miracles came to be so i really do hope you enjoy this one big shout out to nathan because he's such a fucking amazing guy all right everyone please enjoy nathan cavalieri and rolling nathan cavalieri the one and only thank you for joining us um i have to say my pleasure i've been listening to miracles all day today because i've been on the road so you knew knew, your, your new album and it's not what i expected from you um, yeah. in, in a good, very, very good way. It's very eclectic and it's yeah. a hell of a journey. So we're going to talk about all these things that went into miracles. But yeah. I also have to say that you're going, you're in halfway through a tour right now, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah, we did um, a few weeks in Western Australia. We've done Northern Territory, South Australia, a few here in New South Wales. And yeah, about to head up to, to you guys very, very shortly. Very, very soon, yeah. So you're playing the yeah. Imperial, um, was it 16th of September? So um, two Saturdays. I think so. Yep, yeah, and you got Mitchell Creed. Yes, that's right. That's yeah. Well, this coming Saturday. Next. Oh next no, Saturday. sorry. Yeah, because this coming Saturday yes. is the ninth. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's 16th, all a blur, dude. 16th, isn't it? And uh, and Brisbane on the Thursday. Yeah, the Black it, Bear. So. And then you're heading up to Wallaby Creek, um, which is yeah. a festival I've done before. Oh, I've never been there before. I mean, we um we're playing Mitchell Creek as well, and then um. But Wallaby Creek, yeah, never been there. Wallaby I, Creek. I, I don't even know what to expect. Okay, it's a fantastic um, disconnect because oh, because it, the reception man. just goes right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, up, literally. Yeah, you're up in the tablelands. You're sort of like in a um, just like it's it's a showgrounds kind of area, but it's all um, it, there's a big like freshwater creek that you don't. I I didn't shower when I was there. I just went for a swim in that creek, and there's no crocs because it's elevated, so you don't have to worry about that. And okay. that creek is so oh, fresh, nice. and it's it's a very cool festival, man. You you will dig it. Uh, that sounds like it's way up my alley. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing to do. just go up there and reset, and and you, that's yeah. what I, that's what I used that festival for when I when I did it. It was great. So, yeah, nice. Very much looking forward to it. Yeah, we're we're playing there for uh, two nights, so oh, and then I'm on a holiday for Woo. a week. The family going to meet me up at uh, Malula Bar and oh, Coast we're Holiday. Going to spend a week there. Hell What's yeah, that? man! Coast Holiday, yeah. nice one. Because you're yeah. you're based in uh, Sydney, is that where you are, man? Correct. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, yeah, I yeah. I. You actually played um, the Lady Hampshire literally, I think, a week before I played it. I played it last... Oh, uh, no way. Yeah, I played it on the... Um, not last weekend, the weekend before. Huh, Small World. Yeah, and I saw your name like on that on the green room yeah. um, blackboard there. Like, hey! <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It's a good little venue. It's a fun little venue, yeah. man. Um, just so you yeah. know, my cat may make an appearance. That's all right. Cat. He's just making a noise right now. Anyway... <laughs> Um, you did the brave thing with Miracles, your album, by not only producing it, but mixing it and mastering mm. it. So No, I didn't master oh, it. You didn't master it? No, but I mixed it. Yeah, uh, yeah. I draw I draw, draw the line at mastering. Yeah, man. So yeah. I, I draw the line mixing shit. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, well, I've been mixing for I've been mixing for a long time and uh, but it's still obviously I'm not as um uh confident or at least my beliefs in myself are not the same as say what i I would have with songwriting and Mm. and playing guitar and singing and stuff like that but i you know i i ran it by a lot of my 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 mates who whose ears i trust that tell it how it is and they're like dude you should mix it yourself and then i went to andrew sheps Mm -hmm. and um because i'd met him randomly on a boat um we realized actually we had met um back in the days when i was working with michael jackson um but uh yeah i played him a few mixes and he's like dude you got to do this yourself just use me as a backstop so that was my that was how i mixed the album which was an absolute dream because i I really enjoy mixing so to actually learn from a master like andrew chef yeah, you know, yeah. who's done everything from lana del rey to chili peppers and stuff and i'd send my mixes off and he'd give me just some little fine-tuning notes and and um you know that's what made miracles in the end so i always find a pair of fresh ears for mastering comes in handy Oh, mastering is probably my least favorite part of the process. 
mm. like in terms of getting up in my head like I, I i like it and respect it and it does make a difference but in term like talk about mind games like mm-hmm. it's just like because it's at the you're at the very end of the creative process and you just want the album done yep. right <laughs> And, and and you are attached to it. You're attached to everything. So it's really hard um, to make a, a proper call on mastering, to give the, the mastering engineer feedback, especially if you're attached to your mixes. It's really difficult. It's difficult to know when to let go and, and dif- difficult uh, to know when to push. Mm. So Yeah, I've always just been told it's just like the pressing the loud button. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah but but it's more you know especially that. yeah i know and it is pushing the loud button but in order to get that um sometimes there's compromises and and um you know but anyway yeah so how long did this process to to create miracles like M- miracles uh was probably the better part of uh one and a half years yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I'm not going to say like I worked on it every day for one and a half no. years, but that's kind of when I started writing the tunes and demoing and then doing a bit of pre-production, trying multiple different, you know, styles of demos and stuff like that. And then, and then there was like a real, like a four month period of just hardcore every day, mm-hmm. big hours. Um, and, uh, yeah. And I streamed the whole, um, the whole creation process on Twitch. So everything, every take. Uh, even the writing of some of the songs, I streamed the whole thing. So how did you find the reaction on Twitch? Because I've always been curious about this because I've only really seen, apart from gamers on there, I've only really seen DJs um, sort of doing their stuff on there. I've never really seen songwriters on Twitch. So uh, Maybe not so much songwriters. Uh, you'll see like a lot of um, like uh, musicians who kind of do covers. and, oh, yeah. and But there's not too many um, original and sort of like producer-type um, artists um, on there. Mm. I love it. It's been the one of the best additions for me. Like it's, I mean, I'm streaming my time, like how I would spend it anyway. The only difference is, is that I've got people to hang out, you know, and there's, there's other vibes in the air and, and you, you grow an audience as you, the more you stream, obviously. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I got like a really, really passionate audience that was hanging wow. for miracles to be dropped because they watched they, the, part of the process. They watch the whole process. And, yeah. you know, for some people, that's not going to work for them. For some people, they like the surprise. Um, but um, I think, yeah, m- what I learned about my audience is m- most people were pretty interested in the creative process. And if they wanted a surprise, then they wouldn't pay attention to those streams anyway. So um, it was win-win. Yeah, well, it'd be much as, as similar to like a lot, how a lot of people are using utilizing TikTok, I would assume. So, um, yeah. But it's just longer form. Obviously, because TikTok's a short long, form. long form. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so let's get into this this writing process for miracles because of the fact that like because I've known in, of of you basically because like as we were saying before off off air that we're roughly the same age. So I remember seeing you as a kid myself, seeing you as a kid on TV and just going, "This kid shreds." Um, just <laughs> well, you did, man, and you got to jam with like freaking Mark Knopfler and Tommy Emmanuel some amazing guitarists that blows my mind and i can't imagine yeah. what how would how old were you at that time uh all that stuff happened um from about seven years old Jesus till Christ. 14 14 15 <laughs> which to me like i was like oh that's normal life but now i have a i have an eight-year-old that's about to turn nine yeah. and i'm like that's weird <laughs> um, i'd already been two years into the music industry by that point and um it's um it's bizarre yeah so when i was listening to miracles particularly um carencia is it that's that how you pronounce it? Carencia, yeah. carencia yeah it it basically sounded like it, there was a dead dead set dire straits influence just coming straight through into that oh, yeah. song because i yeah, love arms is one of my favorite albums like growing up <sighs> right yeah and, and uh, i went okay that makes sense but then you go and flip things, so I've, I've made quick. I, I don't normally do notes, but I had to basically. I'm um, flattered. So, cool. <laughs> um, so, broken lines to me, like you start off with this full blues boogie thing. I'm like, yep, cool. That's what I expected. And then all of a sudden, you turn it, you flip it straight into this Beatleish kind of like progression with those chords that I was not expecting to come into that kind of blues boogie. Yeah. And it's that kind of shit that I appreciate because. A lot of the time, and so I'm going to put your music basically into adult contemporary now, and I'm, I, I know it hurts, like, as 
us being millennial Gen Xs and we're just sitting there going, yeah, yeah, yeah. something yeah. our parents listen to, but <laughs> we are our parents now. Um, and a lot of stuff I get sent through for me to listen to is a lot of modern indie rock and mm -hmm. all that sort of stuff, right? So to have something that you've created was fresh to my ears and right. you kept on changing it up. I mean, Miracles with the sax playoff and you've got sax coming in in and out of a lot of these songs on this album which i was again not expecting well that i've i've got to credit um a producer called tony buchan um for that because he he um when i made demons the previous album and that was the first solo album i've done since i was signed to michael jackson's label in 1994 right? and yeah. and i wasn't sure even though like I produce, I just wasn't sure whether I'd have, um, uh, whether I'd be able to produce my, like my own stuff, um, and do it justice. So I got him on board as a co-producer and, um, for like half the album. And he was the one who took my demos and just said, why don't we just do something a little bit more unexpected, you know, because it's all, everything that I put together was all pretty standard, like guitars, drums, bass, yep. like, and some pads yep. and stuff like that. And I did, I, I knew that I did want a point of difference. I wanted a pop sensibility with certain songs. I wanted an, a surf rock sensibility in other ones. And, you know, I just wasn't 100% sure on how to get that. And so he was the one who introduced me to just using different instruments. He's like, why don't you put a sax here? And I'm like, oh, Kenny G, I don't want fucking, um, you know, like sax. Like it's, and then, and then, and then he gave me a few references because I hadn't, I'd, I'd, I'd had experience using trumpet, like, mm -hmm in that sort of really cool indie folk way. And I was like, I, I mean, but sax, I wasn't sure. And then he referenced some, um, Tom Waits. Yep. And I think it was like big in Japan or something like that. And and just some gnarly like sax. And I'm like, and then some stones. I'm like, oh yeah, now. Well, even, okay, even I, the Blues I, Brothers I soundtrack, that. mate. If you listen, I know. If you, that, I know. The Blues Brothers band. But funny you mentioned yeah, Tom Waits yeah, because I made notes and, about dry ice. That's, Tom Waits ish, like like with, when you go into your baritone yeah. sort of tone and that, I went, holy, that's Tom yeah. Waits stuff right there. Well, that yeah, and funny, I, I wasn't gonna sing Dry Ice because I felt like a bit of an imposter singing that, and it felt natural, but I, I felt like you know what, I need somebody with a baritone voice, and I couldn't get anybody, so I'm like, well, time's up, <laughs> um, we're, we're releasing this, but um, I suppose it just kind of widened the lens a little bit, and and the palette just got kind of. And uh, and that's just stuck, you know. And mm -hmm. and so sax on on this album is a bit of a a bit of you know a bit of a flavor. There's trumpet as well, and yeah, I, I don't take sax on the road with me, but we take trumpet on the road. And um, yeah, our oh, sax players are moody as fuck, anyway. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I know some amazing sax players because um, I've played in quite a few bands. And <clears throat> yeah, no, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I take that back. They're not moody as fuck. <laughs> Don't hate me, sax players. I love you. Um, nah, stuff him. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, no. no. Um, even like no, the 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 one um, gone to God, where you've gone switched onto like a demo track and make it bossa nova. Like, mm. I love that sort of twist that you did, man. There's so much stuff to come into it. Even the you know, comfort zones, you went like full T Rex meets Bowie. Um, and okay, you're gonna have to correct me if I'm wrong, but is there a talk box on Man on Fire? Yeah. Nailed it. All right. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. The Banshee. Man, it, that, because that was like a full talk box Van Halen meets Stevie Ray Vaughan coming yeah. straight into it. Yeah. Which I don't know if you've used a talk box, a no. proper talk box before, but I, I, I did that live on Twitch as well. And it was hard. It wasn't, it wasn't pretty. I mean, there's a lot. There was, because I'd never <laughs> used one before. There's saliva going everywhere. And I'm like, I, I can't believe my mate, because I borrowed it. My, my mate's not going to want this hose back. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. just. <laughs> That's, um, that's it was difficult tone. just to get, yeah, yeah. But um, no, nah, but I knew I was like, I, I heard it right from the demo. I, I need a talk box on this. So to give it that, what you know, to put it in the wild, really. And there's didgeridoo in that song too. Oh, right. Okay. I didn't pick that. That was one thing. I yeah. Picked. That's in the solo, okay. all those barks. And yep. then there's like a, originally it was just percussion all through the solo and me soloing over the top. And I'm like, you know what? We're in the desert here. We're in Australia. Like that's how, what I imagined with Man on Fire, and I'm like, you know what? I didgeridoo. I've used that before in the past on my old album. You know, blues and didgeridoo, and just like the gravel and everything it goes really well. So um, called up a, a mate of mine, Black Douglas, um, who's an, who's actually a painter. He's an artist, an amazing artist, 
and um, who, um, yeah, played uh, Yadiki, Yadiki, I think it's called. Um, I don't know what the traditional, yeah, I think, yeah, pronunciation. I'm, I've completely butchered yeah. it. So, but anyway, didgeridoo, <laughs> and uh, and that's exactly what it needed. So, mm. yeah, tone. Um, and you cap it all off by something that I did not expect at all. You went full Hendrix on Billie Eilish when, <laughs> when the party is over. And I was half expecting you to, because when I saw the title come up, I went, he's, he's so not going to sing this, right? And then all her was just the guitar went, that actually, it was made for a, like a Hendrix moment, that song, because of the way yeah. that it just builds and builds the way that Billy is creating, well, Billy and Phineas created it. And, and then you switch it around by getting the um the trumpets take the take the lead for a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, I like I love that song. Um, she's amazing. Um, but I didn't when I went to sing it, I was like, I can't sing this. <laughs> like, it's, it's not it's not working for me. They're made for Billie Eilish. Yep. And um, and I'm like, yeah, why don't I just do an instrumental? I haven't heard an instrumental version, you know. And it was yeah, it was somewhere between Hendrix and Roy Buchanan and maybe like, yeah, and then some of that surf psychedelic slide stuff. So it worked, man. Um, I, yeah. I really because uh, I have seen. I took my daughter, my youngest daughter, is a big Billie Eilish fan. I went and saw her live, and I actually went, okay, she's she is a performer. I was, I was. She's amazing. Yeah, I wasn't expecting yeah. it. And then when you've done this and this take on here, I'm like, yep, I could appreciate that definitely. That's cool. Uh, cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah, all good. I was just like interesting takes on shit basically yeah mm. well if i'm going to do a version of something i, I want to just like turn it upside down like it's it's because i don't know i don't want to also reinvent a wheel like so there's just some songs i'm like i can't think of a good version to do of this or something unique or different and and then and, and i'll just let it be but that one you know i did the same thing on on demons because i wanted to do a cold chisel song because jimmy was responsible for, for my first record deal right and i'm like i went through all the culture of the songs i'm like they i can't touch them like i just i couldn't hear anything else I mean, it's, maybe it's my lack of imagination but rising sun mm -hmm. was the one that i i did but i did swamp sort of swamp jj kale blues Ooh. um Ooh. version of it instead of instead of you know the rockabilly yeah. thing yeah, so, yeah yeah which it bangs live but kind of it's we lose a bit of jj cow and we kind of yeah get a little angsty yeah <laughs> did, did, did you get any feedback from from jimmy or ian moss or anything oh like yeah that? they they loved it moss he said the same thing it was um he was stoked with the version yeah nice. yeah and that's that's always a, a risk you know especially if you've got you know people you really look up to and you do a version of one of their songs it's um like what? yeah Man, I, they can, gonna... I can imagine <laughs> you'd feel like they, they're looking over your shoulder just making sure that they're like you're playing the right notes yeah. and on the interpretations yeah. right and everything but yeah a lot of yeah, people yeah. don't realize that if you're playing the cover you just go well you appreciate it it's cool you've given respect to us yeah 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 nicely done yeah. um all right so let's talk about what you went through during the recording of this because i'm i'm assuming this is very it was a very cathartic kind of process for you right yeah i mean like the demons the album before it was was sort of like me not yeah i suppose it was kind of like me dipping my toe in the water mm. i mean i'd done enough gigs after this really black period i went through for about five years that took me away from the stage yeah and so it was a, it was a time of rediscovery it was kind of like i i i want to follow my heart but i'm terrified at the same time right yeah and because i'm kind of afraid i was almost afraid of what if it works like what if and i can't handle it and you know i i, I had terrible self-confidence when it came to my, my ability to psychologically handle lots of things and and emotionally and physically mm. um but i i i i kicked enough goals in my my everyday life to realize that it was something that i needed to move through in, in order to get to the other side and be free of it mm. and um so i did that with music uh did that by creating demons and I because I never intended to return to music during that dark period the music that I came up with during that time was just catharsis it was just self-expression because I wasn't thinking about oh a radio gonna play it or you know are people gonna like it, it was just like this is what I feel like writing right now and if it sits on a hard drive it sits on a hard drive like whatever 
until these group of songs came together and went, I think I want to put them out <laughs> and record them. So that's essentially Demons. And then we toured that. And I toured it with, uh, again, a little bit of, a lot of caution, you know, because I wasn't, I, I wasn't a hundred percent on whether I'd be able to psychologically handle the tour yeah. or anything. So we just did these tiny little runs, but miracles uh, came with fire, mm. you know, because I got to the other side of that and realized what my capacity truly was. And I'm, I was able to make, make peace with my fears and move through them. And, and I felt really liberated and strong. And then miracles was about, all right, let's dive in deep work out what it is I want and what I want to express and what I want to say and what I want to do mm -hmm. and just leap. Like you got to back yourself and just leap. And so it's a lot more open and probably courageous. Demons is probably a little bit more introverted um, and you can hear it creatively. Yeah. This one is, I, I just, I didn't stop. I didn't stop um, connecting with myself. And, and sometimes that meant I'd have to fight face, like creatively I'd have to face voices from the past. I'd have to fight face, you know, beliefs that I had that were trying to box me in. Like, what are people going to think about this? It's not traditional blues. Am I going to let down the blues community that supported me all my life? Like, yeah. what, you know, all this stuff. And, uh, but I, I just kept getting, uh, I kept anchoring myself to my truth, just truth, back to truth, back to my intuition. Um, and that's what miracles is. And, and, you know, that was my, uh, that's how I aligned with any decision from the cover art to business decisions to touring decisions. And that's why we've got this big tour <laughs> that we're in the middle of. I haven't done a tour like this ever since I was a kid. So well, that's a pretty um, fucking big tour to take on. But it, you said, I'm going back into a couple of quotes that you've actually hidden in. And there's something about here that you, you had to fall in love with the, with the stage again. Mm. Why were you afraid of the stage? Well, what... Well, I had like um, some pretty traumatic memories on tour mm. um, back when I, I didn't really have a very good team around me. I didn't really have a team around me, to be honest, other than my musos. And yep. and uh, life just caught up on me, emotions, just lifestyle choices, poor lifestyle choices, lack of education on how to deal with emotions, lack of education on how to deal with grief. Mm -hmm. um, I had insomnia. I had... I've I had terrible gut health issues and you know it, I was really like broken down physically and that then eventually affected me mentally and I was I was burning the candle at both ends in so many different ways like I'd as a screen composer I've been a screen composer for 15 plus years now and and I was also working that five days a week and then I'd drive to Queensland do a couple gigs over the weekend come back you know do more screen composing produce you know mates albums like you know it, it's hard to like respect uh, the, the your energy tank uh, mm. when you love what you do because I was like finally I'm doing what I love you know but it's still energy and it's still energy and it's still output but I also had a lot of personal crap going on as well that I didn't know how to deal with and I tried to tour in that condition and you know I was averaging three hours sleep a night because I couldn't sleep because mm. I started getting you know just anxious all the time and I didn't even know what anxiety was to be honest I just felt out of my body and Yep. and and tripped out and uh and it just caught up on me like everything came with fear like all these everyday little you know potholes mm -hmm. the, it would trigger the inner what i know is like this inner alarm system like everything was just alarm 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 i mean even going to bed was alarm like I, my wife would have to read me <laughs> read me something to go to sleep just to stop the noise from you know in my head and um and then i remember one day uh still trying to push through and do these gigs and and um i was down playing queenscliff music festival great festival i love that festival and um and yeah I, I didn't sleep at all the night before and couldn't hold anything in my belly uh for food and i had a gig on at 1 p.m and it was like a 40 degree day it was really really hot yeah. and we're at this festival and I'm feeling depleted, feeling blood sugar low. That's the other thing I was getting. I was hyperglycemic a lot, like where I, I just have these crazy sugar lows. And um, I remember trying to get some food, but I didn't have anybody around me that could, before the gig, to quickly go and get me some food or whatever. And, and it's like, I've got to get my gear here. Yada. Anyway, too late. Got to get on stage. Mm -hmm. So get on stage. And this is my old band, Nat Cole and the Kings. 
And uh, I pushed through. Things were okay uh, up until like the second last song and I hyperventilated and I, I, I hit the deck. Like I just, I, I had this momentary collapse, which to everybody else might've looked pretty rock and roll, but <laughs> it sucked. And um, I got up and I just didn't, I wasn't normal. Like I just looked out at this blurry crowd and couldn't really make out what I was playing. I walked off stage for a while to get my breath, didn't know what was happening. Got back up on stage because I didn't want to let any, anybody down, finished the gig. And then it hit me. I was like, okay, I've just, I've done it. I, I got through that. That was the worst experience ever. And then I forgot that I had another gig to do in an hour's time. I had to do another one and a half hour sh- uh a set at main stage and nobody there to help you know i didn't i didn't know what to do and that's when the panic attack set I was in say, and, that sounded like you had a full-blown panic attack on stage yeah it was and i didn't know um what that was and didn't know how to get out of it and i just kept getting them mm. over and over you know so then that's what eventually just corrupted my love and my joy for performing. I mean, like I, I, I then just feared, I was terrified of the stage. I was terror. Uh, it, it wasn't until a mate made me realize a, a fair few years later, cause like that was happening in my everyday life as well. And that's yeah. when I, I got to a point where I couldn't even walk out the house. Right. But once I kind of took on, you know, faced those fears and I learned and I built my body back up and everything, and that last big mountain to climb was getting back up on stage again. And he said to me, just remember, it's not the stage that you fear. You feared having a panic attack. Mm-hmm. Like it's, it, that's very different. M- make sure you know the difference between the two. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, he's right. He really is right. And, um, and then, so for, the first step was just proving to myself that I can get back up on the stage. Um, whether I hate it, fear it, doesn't matter it's just like just doing it right yep. and celebrating that you did it you did it the second step was just was all right now let's start to be a bit more intentional on the experience that you want to have on stage you know and accepting all the emotions and everything else that come you may come with it right and just ride those waves and then i got good at that and then um and then eventually once those blocks and you know those those things kind of disappeared this natural love of the stage just return. Like it's like finally like underneath all that shit, mm. right? There really was a love there. I, I just, I couldn't feel it back then. And then once all this crap dissolved, um, it's like this fucking light just came. And, and that's where I'm at at the moment. It's just, it's just something that I really love. Like this year is the first year that I've had probably since 2009, 2010, that I actually feel at home on, on the road. Fuck, dude, I'm starting to tear up. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> Sorry, I, I do know that feeling, okay? Yeah. So, um, I don't know about you, but I become a different person on stage. And the mm. reason why I like going on stage is because I don't have to worry about, for an hour or 45 mm. minutes, whatever it is, all the other shit that's going on this on, on in, in my life, right? Whatever yeah. it is, like my, my day job or... Uh, any other kind of stuff that's going on, I, I, all I'm doing is focusing on playing the bass lines and backing vocals and whatever it is for that minute yeah. and being on stage with whatever band I'm playing with at that time. Yep. And I I used to get anxiety attacks um, before 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 shows. Um, and, and it's usually yeah, right. it's usually before smaller ones. If I'm playing, oh, yeah. if I'm playing before a big in, in a bigger festival sort of thing, I think the adrenaline sort of kicks in, and and those ones there are fine. You get on stage, and everyone becomes all those little faces in the crowd just become like like little blurs. They don't matter. Yeah, it's it's an entity. Yes. Like it's just a yeah. But when you're playing an intimate sort of show and you can see individual faces in there, it, yeah, it, it does fuck with your head a little bit. But I, I tend to push through it anyway, and I usually there's very rarely I have a bad or shitty gig, even if things are going on. So mm. I'm I'm so glad that you've actually found that love again, man. Because it, mm. I hate seeing when musos, particularly those have got have been in the industry for a long time and have immense talent, and they just they just can't play anymore because of can't get beyond it. Well, it's it was um you know who actually uh, really helped with this because. I found it difficult uh, getting industry specific advice on this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, like yeah, back then no when one, I was. No one ex- tells you, bro. Nah. Because if you, like, 
when you think about it, it's like, let's just say I'm an artist who has panic attacks and I struggle getting on the stage. Well, is a promoter going to book me? Yeah. What if, it, if I book him and he can't get up on the stage or like, you know, so it's natural why like people want to keep it to themselves and everything. But obviously the, the, the downside to that is like they, they become islands, mm-hmm. right? So n- nobody can help them. But then also these other people who are struggling, they think they're the only ones, right? So, and um, so, I mean, you know, at that time I was like, well, I'm probably not going to, unless I fix this, I'm not going to be returning yeah. anytime soon anyway. So I ended up um, having great t- chats with Mark Lazotte, Diesel. Yep, Diesel, yep. Um, but, but one of the most trans, um, one of the most inspiring conversations I had with another artist on this stuff was Wes Carr. Oh, right. Who, yeah. Yeah. He used to live up, up um, your way. Yeah. And he, he, his story and my story were very, very similar. Mm. And, and the more I'm talking to other artists is, that have, have dealt with it, it's like, wow, this is, this is a normal thing. This is like yep. being human. It should be being human. Do you know what they like, usually do for make a, how, how we supposed to cope with it a lot of the time? Alcohol. Yeah. Alcohol. Yeah. Self-medication. Drugs. Yeah, totally. That's, yeah. Yep, that's how <laughs> we've got to mask it. Awesome. Yeah. Well, and he, you know, he, um, I talked to him at a time when he was like three years, like sort of um, in progression to me. Like, so he was, he'd already kind of overcome a lot of that. Right. Yeah, he's on and side. so he was able to kind of talk to me about the things that he did and, you know, and what worked for him before going on stage and, the, and how, how he eased into it, you know, like he was, he was, he was as messed up as what I was. And uh, so that was just enough to, for me to just remind, you know, to, to go, oh, I'm not stuck like this. Yeah. Like this is, this is a process that I have to go through it. There are lessons that I need to learn, mm-hmm. but now there's like this thing on the other side where I'm like, okay, cool. I'm not doomed. I'm not, you know, cause I, I had some terrible advice from um, uh, doctors around me, like yep. terrible advice that, you know, that, and, and people around me, uh, not my family, fortunately, uh, but, you've, but just a lot of people, a lot of bad advice, yeah. a lot of a lot of bad stories, a lot of like, oh yeah, I've been struggling that with thirty years, I just can't get on top of it, or you know, here, take these antidepressants, um, you know, after a fifteen minute um, long, uh, you know, session, and you're going to be on them forever. Like, oh well, where are the tools? Like, can I learn anything to help me? Now? Oh no, it's a genetic thing. You're, you're biochemically fucked. You know whatever like this i had so much of that around me yeah. and i'm just i'm so glad that i trusted my gut yep. and found those that's the that little support network and they were in unique situations you know they weren't they weren't your your common yeah mm. yeah everyday uh professional that's for sure and you're on the other side of it man so proud that's good and thanks mate uh, you got 17 dates to go. I'm going to wrap things up now because you've got that little warning thing in here. But yeah, you got 17 dates to go and sounds like you're killing it. So good job, Nath. Man, oh, thank you, mate. Yeah, but I'm super, super pumped to get up to, to the Sunshine Coast as well. Like it's it's one of my favorite spots to, to play. And when we played the Imperial last time, which was actually during COVID, it just it went off. Yeah, it went generally off, does so. that, man. Yeah. Should be sweet. All right, Nath, I'm going to wrap this up. Everyone else should yep. check out the Miracles um, album. It is, like I said, so eclectic, and it was, it was a joy to listen to it several times, and I'm still listening to it now. Um, <laughs> they can catch you. You're, you're starting your next run on the 14th of September, which is the Black Bear Lodge, and then you got Mitchell Creek on that weekend as well as the Imperial Hotel on the 16th, and then you're going to Wallaby Creek, and then you got all those dates. They're all on your um, website. Is that all right? on my website, yep, yeah. yeah. nathancavalieri.com forward slash tour, and then also, yeah, jump on Twitch if you want to catch me live. I'm on there like three three to four times a week so wow if you want to have a conversation we we, we do all sorts of stuff on there so, yeah all right man you hang on the one there i've got Come a man. quick debrief but for everyone else do check out miracles great album this has been nathan cavalieri cheers man i really hope you enjoyed that podcast with nathan so big shout out to nathan and his team for putting that together um and do check out the album miracles um i have to say that it's it's probably one of my favorite albums this year um, and I mean that wholeheartedly. Uh, just so eclectic and just not what I expected. And a big shout out to my cat, Edward, that kept on coming in and out. I don't know if you heard him. You might have heard him scratching. Anyway, I've got stuff to do. It's Big Sound Week. So, yeah, let's get into all the stuff that is Big Soundy, I guess. 
do go check out Nathan Cavalieri on tour. The rest of those dates I'll chuck up in this podcast as well. Um, thank you for supporting local music, live music, Australian music, all sorts of music. You guys are legends. Cheers.